Check, 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 one, two. It is Friday, November 18th, 2022. And here we are again with another Sierra Chart C++ custom study. And this time it is a pace of tape study, which is really popular in Jigsaw and a couple other platforms. I know that a couple of the guys in Fat Cat's Discord have mentioned a few other pace of tape studies that are out there for purchase, but I decided to build one and share it with you all so that you could see how it was constructed and how it works. And this is it down here, actually. So I have Tesla up here. Um, this is the pace of tape here, and I can show you how it functions real quick. So you can choose to have it in a vertical mode. You can flip it to horizontal. I built it so it can go both ways. Um, you can change the number of seconds that it examines. So if I wanted it to look at 30 seconds, I'd leave it here. If I wanted to look at 60 seconds, I'd up this to 60, etc. That is the number of seconds it examines. Uh, number of squares to draw. This is currently set at 5. You can make this 10. You can make this 3. Play around. Do whatever you feel like is uh, convenient for you. I kind of like 5 uh, just to give me a nice uh, idea of where, what percentage we're at for pace of tape. The square size can be modified as well. If you prefer something a little bit larger, you can go ahead and pop up to that and then if you prefer something a little bit smaller and more discreet you can go down. Um, the outline color is going to be what the rectangles are outlined in, <clears throat> the squares, and then the start and end colors are the gradient. So you can see this is kind of, actually let me make this a little bit larger, you can see the gradient as this moves along towards higher pace of tape versus a lower pace of tape on the, this side. So you can specify a start color and an end color. Um, you can enable statistical information to be displayed here by enabling the text. And so what this is, is this is the maximum number of ticks per second calculated since the last 30 rolling seconds. So this is the current number of ticks per second, and this is the percentage that is currently being done of this max. So you can see we hit 93% there. So you can kind of see what's going on under the hood there. Um, text color, self-explanatory, fill transparency. If you want it to be more transparent, make the number higher. If I make this 90%, you'll see that they get more transparent. And at zero, it would be completely uh, opaque. Font size, self-explanatory. It only works when the text is enabled. And then here you have an ability to offset move this around. Basically the zero point is the bottom right corner and then I have horizontally offset it 10% so I've moved it over 10% of the screen. And so let's dive into what this actually does. Oh, one more thing actually before we do that. I've added this feature to be able to reference a different symbol. So you could add multiples of this study to one um, graph, one chart, and then you could have like, like if you're trading stocks you could have Tesla, and then also add a, a SPY or an ES pace of tape and then position it down here. And I'll show that at the end, but you can type in a different symbol here and use that as a reference. So I am going to go ahead and walk through the code here. So if you're just interested in the study, you can go ahead and download it from the GitHub um, link that'll be there in the description of this video, but if you want to know how the code works, let's go ahead and start. If you don't know anything about Sierra Chart, then go back and watch some of the other Sierra Chart coding videos. But this is going to be picking up, uh, basically, assuming that you know at least a little bit about uh, Sierra Chart coding, C++, or programming in general. So the first thing I do up here is I actually am creating and defining a structure. Um, I'm calling it records per unit, and uh, it's pretty much records per second, number of ticks per second, and it only stores two things, the number of ticks and then the time, the integer representation of time in seconds, um, and I'm going to use that later on. Here in our Sierra chart function, we have a bunch of inputs, which we just walked through. Um, the definition of those inputs and their defaults are here in the default code block. Um, you can go take a look at that. First thing we do here, once we get into the actual meat of the function, of the study, I should say, we go ahead and declare a structure that will hold our time and sales data that we're going to fetch from Sierra Chart. And here we do a calculation to figure out what symbol we're going to use. If, if that input that we had 
uh, this one here, if it's empty here, you can see if it's empty, then we just use the chart symbol. Otherwise, we'll use a different symbol. Um, then we go ahead and grab the time and sales data for that, and we store it into this uh, object up here that we declared. If we don't have anything returned, we bomb out. And then here we go ahead and grab the input for the desired number of squares that we want to draw. And then I create, remember that structure we defined up top? I create a, um, a vector of them, this structure right here. <clears throat> I create a vector of that struct. And what we will end up doing is populating it lower to uh, down here to keep track of the number of ticks every single second had. Um, next, we grab the number of desired seconds to examine, a couple of safety checks, figure out the total size of the tape records that we got back from Sierra chart. We go ahead and fetch the very last tick and we get the date and time from it and calculate the last time in seconds as an integer value. The reason is, is because we need to work backwards, right? So if the last tick was right now and I wanted to examine 10 seconds, we'd take the time right now in seconds, subtract 10 from it to go back 10 seconds and then start going, okay, how many ticks in the 10 seconds ago, 9 seconds ago, 8 seconds ago, etc. So that's why we have to do that. And this is just a calculation of what would be our very first uh, time in seconds. So again, if we use 10 seconds as an example, if the most recent tick is now, then the start time would be 10 seconds ago. That's what this is representing. And then what we do is just go ahead and instantiate, um, or rather uh, populate our vector of that structure that we talked about up here with empty records so that we can update them as we roll through. Then we go ahead and we rip through every single tick that we, every single trade and piece of tape execution that we got back from Sierra chart. We start at the beginning and go forward and we grab the time in seconds, skip anything that isn't after the first second. So if we if we when, we when we request data from Sierra chart like the tape, it will grab us um, a lot of different records going back more than 10 seconds. So we basically fast forward until the 10 seconds ago. That's what this is doing. Then we determine whether it was a level two update or a, uh, an execution on the bid or the ask. We only wanted to count at real executions. We don't care about market depth updates. And then we go ahead and find the appropriate second in our structure and we add uh, a tick to it so that we can count how many ticks per second. So this is how we're keeping track of how many ticks per each second over the last 10 or whatever you put as the input seconds that you have. Then we go ahead and do some number crunching. We need to calculate the average over the how many seconds we had, how many, what is the average ticks per second over the entire length. And then I go ahead and actually do a quick average, which is dynamic based on the number of squares that is wished to be drawn. And I'll show you why I need this later. I don't need it, but it makes things less jerky by having, uh, it like smooths out the, the action and the behavior of this, otherwise it's jumping all over the place. Um, so I use a quick average <clears throat> to smooth out the visuals of this indicator. And uh, it's very similar to calculating the actual average up here. And then we go ahead and keep track of the maximum number of records per second we encountered over the last X number of rolling seconds. So again, if 10 seconds is what we're examining and 10 seconds ago we had 100 records, 100 ticks go, and then it was something like 10, 20, 20, 20, the max would be the the 100 and that's what would be stored here. We need that because that's what we're going to be calculating our pace of tape off of. Um, we want to do some safety checks so we're not dividing by zero anywhere. Here's our actually calculation of zero to 100 percent for the pace of tape which is going against the max number of records. We calculate the number of squares we actually need to color. So there's the squares we need to draw, but then there's also the ones we need to fill in. And that is going to be a representation of the percentage, the pace of tape, zero to 100% of uh, pace of tape, and multiply that by the number of total squares to be drawn. And that gives us the number of squares we want to color. And then here's some more of the smooth, smooth adjustments that I need to put in, because it was just jerky. Um, you can read through the logic here, but basically it is just taking care of some edge cases which make it look funny and make it a little bit wonky. Um, more safety checks here, and then here we are starting our color gradient piece. So you can see the color is going gradient from uh, left to right as this goes, and 
you can see that I am grabbing the colors that were provided in the inputs here. So that's the color of the outline, that's the color of the start, and then here's the color of the end. And so, and then here we're grabbing the transparency from the input. What I do is I get the red, green, and blue values from the start colors and the end color. And I get them as integer representations. So here's the integer representation of red in the start. Here's the integer representation of green in the start, blue in the start, red in the end, green in the end, blue in the end. These are all numbers now. And then now that I have that, I can actually calculate the difference between the numeric values in the red, green, and blue. And then, based off of that, and knowing the number of squares we have, I can dynamically calculate the step interval needed in order to bump up as we make a gradient from the start color to the end color. Because these are all numbers. These, these representations of colors are actually just mixtures of red, green, and blue. Um, and like, let me show you this. This might actually make it more, more sense. Like, outline color is here, right? If I click this, you get this little pop-up, and you can see this yellow is made of 255 red, 255 green, and zero blue. And as you move the slider around, you can see the values of red, green, and blue change. Their integer values change, because those colors are represented by the, these integers for, for these three primary colors that are within them. And so that's how you actually calculate the colors. So by calculating the interval, which is essentially the step size, I can step to from the start color to the end color by stepping through these intervals. And then um, what I do is, and I link to some documentation here because uh, the width of the Sierra chart chart is not in from zero to 100%. It's actually from zero to 150. So there's a multiplier that we have to multiply everything for positioning on the horizontal axis on the Y or on the X axis. Um, and it all needs to be multiplied by one and a half. Uh, if you want more information on that, you can go to the CR chart docs to learn about why. Um, this is just a check to make sure if the user is actually hiding the study, we don't draw anything. Here are the offsets that the user can enter in the settings, and then here's the layout, whether it's vertical or horizontal to be desired. And then here we're actually drawing the squares. So I'm creating a drawing tool. I'm assign, uh, assigning a drawing type of rectangle. I'm going to draw a bunch. Of, so these are just separate little rectangles that I'm drawing, just little squares, little squares, little squares, using vertical positioning. And then depending on if it's a vertical or horizontal layout, I am going to go ahead and do the calculations for the beginning of the square down here to the end of the square up here. Um, actually, I'm doing it for, for this uh, horizontal layout. I'm doing it from up here to down here, and then up here to down here, and then up here to down here, and then up here to down here, up here to down here. That's how I'm drawing them. So the begin value is uh, going to be a value that takes the re desired square size, which is changeable in the input, and it's going to multiply that uh, by the square that we are on to be drawing, add the square size to itself to like bump us up, and then also include that vertical offset. Um, that is what is going to calculate our y-axis, so that's our up-down. So that's where we get this starting point, like right here. Um, and then it's going to be different if you have a horizontal layout where you can see that the, the equation is different. So you can walk through these, spend some time on them. Um, it took me a little bit of trial and error to get this going, but you can go ahead and take a look and modify this, play around with it to get I don't know, maybe you want to change it to be circles. You can make like little circles using the same premise. Um, and again, the two different layouts uh, codes here are for the ability to be able to hit this, change this to vertical, and then have it go up, draw rectangles going up instead of across. So those require two different calculations. Um, basically, then, it's just finishing off the drawing tool. Uh, we're using this add or adjust property because we want to either add a rectangle or adjust its positioning or, or what it looks like. And we have a line width of just one for our outline, transparency level getting set, outline color getting set, and then some coloring logic here. And then down here is the logic for the text 
Uh, if you want to have that text display, then you can go ahead and turn enable text on, and then you can have this text display. This controls all the logic for that. So I'll keep that off for now, but let you play with that once you see it. And then now what I'd like to do is actually go into analysis studies, and then I'm just going to go ahead and duplicate this. And I'm going to call this one um, ES uh, paste of tape. And instead, I'm going to put ESZ22-CME in here, which is the current ES contract. And I'm just going to give it a vertical offset a little bit higher. So it's going to basically show the same thing. And then instead of this color, let's, let's do a different color. Let's do, um, oh, I don't know. Let's do this color all the way up to the end color of this and let's go ahead and see what that looks like so there it is and so that one is actually grabbing the paste of tape from the ES and putting it there let me make it a little bit different uh, let me set a vertical offset of four just to give it some separation and then let me go ahead and change the color outline from this to this so it doesn't look quite the same and then you can really see the difference there. So you can set up as many as you want of these and reference other symbols, um, future symbols, stock symbols, whatever. You could have ES and NQ going at the same time. But here you can see Tesla's pace of tape is like around here, and then ES is a little bit slower here. So anyways, that is the pace of tape tool that I just finished. Um, developing. I don't know if it's all the way done, but most of the features I wanted in there are in there. I'll go ahead and share this with the community. Hope that was helpful, and um, let me know if you find this useful.